then I'm on mute. Okay.
Yes. Okay, let's begin. So, welcome everybody to this keynote of uh, Silvia Federici. I will give a short introduction about the program and later on I will pass the word to my colleague Vivian. Uh, so my name is Jesse. I work at the institution as curator of collective learning um, since May, 2018. Uh, and we have been practicing collective learning in our programs uh, since that time, uh, which means that we are exploring different and new ways of education. Um, we are hosting this event from Melly, and Melly is uh, the ground floor space uh, of the institution. Uh, we host our events here mainly. Uh, Melly is also a space uh, that came about uh, also in 2018, and it was named by a group of youngsters from Rotterdam uh, as part of an educational program. Um, this keynote uh, is part of our transition program, uh, which started the first week of September, uh, after a while of being closed and not having any programs or events at all because of the COVID. Um, so since the beginning of September, we started with a series of events uh, from this transition program based on choreography and harmony as part of the online offline transition. Uh, we explored what it means to be uh, together in a space again after eh, all this time of uh, not seeing each other or touching each other or being together. Um, and this keynote is the final event of this series uh, before our fall and winter exhibition opening on this Sunday. Um, also, this series of events uh, was mainly uh, organized by some of our uh, colleagues, which we call fellows, uh, which are also um, participants from that previous uh, educational program, uh, part of the collective learning uh, series. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna give the word to my colleague Vivian who will introduce uh, the speakers and uh, the rest of the program. Unmute, okay. Uh, Goeyavond uh, and welcome in Melly uh, here in Rotterdam. And uh, yeah, welcome uh, to uh, familiar people who are with us, uh, to those who've been uh, within this space in Rotterdam. And of course, we're online, so there could be uh, greater audiences internationally, uh, in which case, please uh, be very welcome. Uh, I'm the research and programs manager here at FKAWDW, and it's my particular pleasure, together with my colleague Jesse to introduce this evening's keynote program as the culmination of our transition series. It's the third in our new keynotes uh, series, which invites singular voices uh, and creates a new venue for coming together in reflection and exchange here in Rotterdam. Tonight's program uh, was originally planned to take place physically here in May. And uh, Sylvia was booked to fly through Milan uh, en route to being with us. And while here we planned among other things to investigate some of the archives of the Dutch persecution of witches in the 15 and 1600s, we now meet under very different circumstances with Sylvia joining us from uh, Brooklyn where she lives and where she's been uh, during this period. However, we remain really thrilled uh, to connect and are more convinced than ever of the resonance of Sylvia's abiding critique of the political reproductive economy. Tonight's keynote is titled with a question, COVID-19, a health crisis or a political crisis, a question mark. And its central theme is the socio-political restructuring uh, taking place under the guise of the pandemic, along with tools and tactics of resistance. The topic of pandemic uh, is not necessarily new uh, for Sylvia, however. Uh, perhaps her best known book, Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body and Primitive Accumulation, is premised in part in the European labor crisis that resulted in the late 14th century uh, as uh, part of the aftermath of the bubonic plague. Then, amid uh, acute labor scarcity, uh, a refusal of rent became a collective phenomenon with entire villages refusing to pay fines, taxes, and tillage. A motif emerged during this time, uh, Sylvia shares with us in this book, uh, in what she calls this period of a whirlwind of revolution, 
through proletarian insurrection. Uh, and in particular in Florence, the wheel of fortune began to appear on the walls of taverns and workshops to symbolize an imminent change of lot. And that's a quotation from the book. So this image of the wheel of fortune and a changing of lots is a very valuable one to reflect upon at the present juncture and to consider what submerged structures are revealed in the pandemic uh, as industries like technology, retail and software recover strongly, while at the same time travel, entertainment, hospitality and food services continue to decline past March levels, are we witnessing a transformation or a consolidation of the political economic structure? Tonight, Sylvia will uh, offer her thoughts uh, and as informed by her longstanding engagements at the forefront of movements for social and feminist justice internationally. Following uh, Sylvia's talk, we will be led in a Q&A by our guest moderator, Ileana Fokianaki. Uh, Ileana is a critic, curator and director of State of Concept in Athens. Uh, this program coincides with a solo exhibition of new work by Kapwani Kiwanga, guest curated by Ileana and opening this Sunday. Uh, Ileana's participation in this uh, tonight is additionally supported by Het New Institute in conjunction with the Gossips Lecture Series, which is a project in dialogue with Sylvia's writing. Um, please be welcome to note a question in the Q&A uh, window and we will try to get to as many of these as possible. So uh, without uh, further ado, Sylvia, I'd like to virtually uh, ask you to take the floor or to virtually hand the microphone to you and to uh, uh, offer great appreciation for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. And thank you, you all, Jesse, Iliana, and all that have organized this event. And greetings to the people who are listening. And, uh, you know, the, the title of uh, this keynote address, it's, um, it's very quickly, very quickly answered. And uh, clearly what we have been witnessing, you know, with the COVID pandemic, it's a political crisis. And uh, you know, the signs of this crisis have been there for many, many, many years. For uh, since at least the 1970s, with the inset of the neoliberal phase of capitalist development, you know, we have seen a systematic, willful dismantlement of all the infrastructure that have been most important for the uh, reproduction of our daily life. Um, I cannot speak in very, very general terms, although I understand that the trends have been pretty similar, but taken as a point of reference, the United States, you know, I can say that for example, systematically year after year, you know, the budget for healthcare uh, has been reduced on national as well as municipal levels. Uh, in addition, we have seen really a disinvestment dismantling of many social services, you know, that have alleviated people's burden for work from daycare to center for the seniors. We have also seen the impact you know, of uh, overwork. You know, we are living in a very strange time in which on one side we have an increase on unemployment and on the other, we have had a, you know, practically the, the development of working days that rival the length of the working day in the industrial revolution. You know, an extension of the work day, which has particularly used the time to be devoted to reproduction, which means the more and more people have used fast foods and uh, that has increased obesity, that has undermined our immunity system. Again, the deterioration of the quality of air, the quality of the water, 
more and more contaminated. We hear of this apocalyptic report, you know, of cities in Asia, in India, in China, where for the months people do not see the sky because the air is so polluted. And this, of course, effect on and on and on and on. Right. So, and of course, this is only part of the crisis because as uh, the slogan goes now in the United States, the most important pre-existing condition that makes people vulnerable is social disequality, racism. We have seen, for instance, the communities that have been most directly impacted, you know, have been community of immigrants, black community, also community of all the people in nursing homes, and uh, all the people who don't have the means, you know, to, to be able to have a certain type of care. And these have been the community where we have seen the highest number of mortalities. So it's a, it's a, it's a complex of crisis. It's a complex of crisis, none of which have been created, none of which is completely new. And the epidemic has actually intensified and brought to the service, you know, crises that were already existing. And in some, it has brought to the surface the fact that we live in a social system that systematically devalues our life, systematically dismantling, devaluing, disinvesting in the process of reproduction is really you know, a manifestation of the low level of importance that is given you know, to the life of the majority of people at least those who are not property owners. So the situation that we are facing, you know, is a situation that really requires, you know, a, a very broad range of response. And uh, I think it's important to see that this is not a passing crisis, but it's a very profound structural one. And I'm, uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that I think that this realization, you know, is now taking hold. More and more people realize that something very systematically has to change. I'm very glad, Vivian, that, uh, you know, you reminded me about uh, the effects of another plague, you know, at the beginning. In fact, at the end of the feudal time, and uh, many people see the effects of the Black Death, you know, as having played a role in the beginning of capitalism, you know, because this was a plague that uh, killed uh, more than one third of the European population and had very contradictory, very contradictory uh, effects because on one side, uh, it gave in a way more power uh, to the workers, the serfs, that survive, who now had more access to land, who now could actually move from one estate to the other, or in the urban center, the artisan could actually aspire to higher wages because of the massive depopulation. And on the other, of course, it brought back a backlash, a tremendous backlash on the side of the merchant, the feudal lords. Are we going to witness something similar today. What, what are the prospects? You know, and of course, it's impossible to read into the future. But what we can see is that, you know, as in the 14th century, today as well, and of course, Naomi Klein reminded us, you know, with the theory of the shock doctrine, you know, that every shock to the social system, social economic system, it's an opportunity uh, for, uh, for major revision. And we, we are in fact at that crossroad. We are at that crossroad. Clearly the capitalist class, is very interested in using the crisis provoked by the COVID for the major, major restructuring. And you know, you mentioned some already of the guidelines and uh, you know, it's uh, very briefly because uh, the lack of time, 
But uh, strangely enough, uh, for many years, the capitalist class has been arguing that uh, capitalism is in crisis. You know? And proof of it has been the low level of growth almost uh, worldwide. Uh, the fact that the interest rate in many countries now are nearing zero. You know, it's quite uh, amazing because uh, at the same time, you know, we have seen massive level of exploitation, you know, but the attempt to produce a technological leap, the high investment in technology, right, have also clearly been part of this process. And I think that uh, the epidemic is going to be used in a way, you know, to uh, redress the, the balance, to increase the exploitation of labor, to restructure many economic sectors, you know, in such a way that, for example, we are going to see um, more and more work now, you know, uh, organized through Zoom organized on a home basis. So there's going to be clearly one of the direction is the further dismantling, which has already begun in the 70s, you know, with the dismantling of the great industrial processes, the great industrial conglomerate, you know, in the United States, for example, the whole industrial belt was completely dismantled. Detroit, Michigan, um, and work was reorganized on a maquila basis. I think we are going to see a further development or at least the attempt right, to further uh, confine, for example, some of the educational processes as well as many forms of work in a way that saves the, the capitalist entrepreneur a lot of overhead expenses. And at the same time, isolate workers, making it much more difficult to organize, making it much more difficult uh, to, in fact, uh, push certain demand and certain transformation uh, in the organization of work, in what is being produced, that we know are very, very vital. And, uh, and they're really on, on the world agenda today. And uh, so uh, the question also for us, is whether we can take that opportunity, whether we can take that opportunity in order to be able to effect the change that we know is necessary, not just in response to the epidemic, but in response to a capitalist system who systematically, you know, as I said before, denies the value of our life and is becoming more and more repressive, more and more violent, more and more militarized, you know, more and more committed to channel the social wealth that we produce into warfare and into all kinds of repressive mechanisms. So um, I think the signs are encouraging. Speaking of the United States, we have seen a tremendous response uh, in the cities, in across the country, first of all, you know, through in organizing many, many forms of mutual aid, right? The kind of first aid response, you know, making sure, for example, that uh, people would have some of the basic necessities. And uh, this has been a, a very broad effort, delivering food, collecting food. But at the same time, there is an understanding that this is not enough that as important as the immediate response is, what we now need to think of and, and organize is the long-term. And, uh, and I think here that uh, uh, women and uh, women's movement in particular have a special role. Uh, I don't want to single out the feminist movement or women's liberation movement in general, you know, as being uh, unique. Uh, on the contrary, you know, today I think the future, the possibility of an effective social transformation really rests upon, you know, our ability, you know, to create a broad coalition 
to see the connection, the ties, different struggle. At the same time, I would also repeat that I think that women in general are in a special position to see what the role they had must be. Um, undoubtedly, women are pain, and in particular, you know, women of color, black women, immigrant women, all those who have a whole history of marginalization and discrimination in the first place. But also women in general are in a good position, you know, uh, to, to see, you know, how unsustainable, unsustainable this system is and how much it is a life and death matter for us today. If we want to offer the future to the children that are being born, to the children that are growing, how a major change has to happen. Today, you know, women are breaking down, right? And at the same time, they are breaking down. And in this case as well, the crisis precedes the epidemic, right? By the epidemic has intensified because we have on a mass level, a situation where women have a wage job which in many cases are carrying on through Zoom from their own homes. At the same time, as they have to care for children who are also at home because the schools are continuously opening and closing. And they find themselves, the crisis that they have lived every day of trying to reconcile, work outside the home, and reproductive labor, you know, in the hope to gain some autonomy, to have some money of their home, not to depend on a man, right? And that, that constant struggle today is exploding, right? Today is exploding. And uh, I, I've heard uh, from uh, you know, different places that, um, the number of articles, for instance, that women teachers or women or writers are submitting to, to journals, to book, to publishers has collapsed because it's impossible to work in a situation in which you are continuously besieged. And so that impossibility, I think it's also been transformed into a wisdom into a knowledge and uh, the need for collective labor, the need for cooperation, the need to change the organization of our reproductive life, I think is something that is particularly acutely felt you know, by women. And uh, here I want to evoke the experience that uh, I've learned from you know, the, the experience of, from other countries, from other women's organization, you know, that have uh, in time of crisis have responded precisely, you know, with uh, the bring, bringing together their effort, you know, going beyond the traditional type of isolation in which women have carried on their reproductive work, beginning to uh, form spaces in which to discuss collectively uh, what to do, what are the problem, how to organize them, and uh, you know, create forms and infrastructure that can allow us you know, to overcome, and not only overcome, the immediate crisis, but also have more power with regard to the state. And this is what I have been uh, defining and calling the politics of the common. You know, I think that really we need a major, major uh, effort, not only by women, right? But certainly women are the ones who have most direct interest you know, in a restructuring of the whole field of reproductive infrastructure, which is very, very broad, 
because it includes the home, it includes healthcare, it includes the raising of children and education. And I think we need as women to come together and to discuss and to organize around this issue. And not only organize, you know, around the issue they have to do with the traditional workplace. I think that this is the moment now to recognize that we are living in a society where, uh, with institutions that do not guarantee in any form our reproduction. They do not offer our children, unless they have private wealth, do not offer really any future. Where the constant defunding of our life and rechanneling of what we produce, the result of our work towards police repression, towards war, towards acquiring more means of destruction, that this is going to be the, the norm and this is going to actually accelerate. That what we look at the future is a future that without wanting to be apocalyptic, but certainly is a future that really provides no hope unless we are capable of effecting a powerful change. And that change cannot take place only uh, by our efforts isolated. We actually need to come together and create spaces where we can come together and discuss, plan, and organize joining the different struggle. And what I mean joining, none of us can fight over the whole arc, you know, of reproductive, uh, reproductive uh, issues, right? But the important things is whether we can connect our struggle and give power to each other. So that the struggle of a healthcare is not disconnected from the struggle about, for instance, having urban gardens, from the struggle around uh, child raising, from the struggle you know, around putting an end to the militarization of our life. And this, this, is the, this is the part, it seems to me, that is most promising if we want to really uh, live this kind of uh, world in which there is no hope. But of course, central to it is the question of the inequalities and whether the reforms that we are fighting for and the changes that we are fighting for are changes that are subverting the inequalities, the hierarchies that have been built in this society. I think this is very important because all too often, and here in the United States, one good example that we have, for instance, is the New Deal. The New Deal has been celebrated by workers' organizations for decades and decades as having been a milestone in terms of you know, workers getting certain benefits, the social pension, guaranteed health care. But all of this has been for white workers, fundamentally for white workers. Actually, most of the jobs the black workers have had you know, have been completely excluded. We do not want that. Uh, the construction of inequality, the construction of a racist society has been one of the most powerful instruments for the perpetuation of capitalism. This society would have no hope of reproducing itself because it's so unjust and uh, it's organized in such a dehumanizing way. But the way they have, the system has been able to, in fact, create division, you know, among those who, in fact, should unify, you know, has been a very, very, very powerful instrument. So I think it is very crucial that as we are thinking, right, of the kind of infrastructure that we need, of the kind of the organization of the productive work that we need and has to be a very broad organization because we have to think of a different type of agriculture. Enough with an agriculture that poisons the land, poisons the water and poisons our bodies. What we put in the land, we put in our bodies. 
In America Latina, women say, mi cuerpo, mi territorio, right? There is a direct continuity between the destruction, you know, of the land, the effect of the pesticide and all the venoms that are put into it, and the collapse of our immunity system. We speak of the epidemic of COVID. Many more people die of cancer every year. Why did nobody speak of the epidemic of cancer? I hardly know anybody in the United States, a man, my friend, myself too, I already had two cancers, two cancers. My mother's generation, they, my mother's generation, we never, very few women used to speak cancer was like a big, big thing. Now, almost everybody I know has had cancer, not to mention those who have died of it. So I think it's very important, I was saying that the, Transformation is broad ranging. Agriculture, uh, the, the question of control of a food production. One interesting discussion taking place among women, among community of activists now in the United States. Everybody says we have to grow our own food. We have to grow our own food. Yeah? For instance, because it was so difficult to have access to food for a number of weeks, at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody said, well, we need to have food security. Food security, we have to find ways that we control. Food production cannot be allowed. Let to the big companies, right? Where sometimes food comes from far, far away places. We have no idea how it has been produced, what the production has cost to the people who produced it. How much blood has been spilled for the food that we eat or for the clothes that we are eating because we are being so far away from the people who are producing the things that we're using every day. All that has to hand, all that has to hand. Healthcare, that's another big field of struggle. Obviously we cannot be autonomous completely for healthcare. But we can recuperate all kinds of knowledges and do work of prevention. In the mid 19th century in the United States, there was a popular healthcare movement that basically took the slogan saying, every person a doctor. A lot of women worldwide today are doing the same. They are trying to organize a kind of healthcare that first of all is based on prevention. It's based on prevention and on the idea that what you need to do is strengthening your body. And you strengthen your body, first of all, by not exposing it to all the deadly substances to which today we are uh, uh, daily exposed, right? And, uh, and where the cure is not the kind of warfare on our body that is often given to us as a therapy. And politics of the common means that when we face the institution, when we go to a hospital, when we go to a medical institution, we do not go alone. We do not go without some knowledge. We do not go uh, without some forms of control. Today, women are afraid of going to the hospital, particularly black women particularly black women who often have gone to a hospital to deliver and they came out sterilized. And uh, it's very important that again, the coming together, not facing the state in our struggle, in our negotiation, in the services that we use, that we do not face it alone, but we face it as part of a community with the strength of a community. This seems to me that is the way forward, uh, both in the sense of instituting processes of reappropriation, reappropriation of, of wealth, so that we have more power to decide how it is used, the appropriation of our decisional power 
being able to reappropriate the power to make decisions. And, uh, and this can only come, you know, when we transcend the isolation which we have traditionally suffered and which the COVID has now intensified. One of the worst consequences of this pandemic has been that it has separated us, isolated us even more than before, you know? And worse, it has created a kind of fear, you know, of the other person, fear of other people, and particularly of those who have been most marginalized. So now people fear black people because we are told that they are those who are more easily affected. Or in the United States, there have been many episodes of racism against people from Asia because the president keep calling COVID the Chinese disease. So, you know, now we also have that. But generally, there is a fear of the other person which is intensify the kind of distrust that this system continuously try to inject into our communities. So I, I, I'm moderately optimistic because I see that there are powerful you know, movements that can be a counterpower. They can be in this moment a counterpower and uh, are putting actually, you know, the, the, they are signaling something very, very crucial, you know, precisely highlighting the very political nature of this epidemic, that the solution is not a vaccine. Of course, there may be a vaccine and we know that it's going to be subject to a tremendous speculation. It is already. The vaccine is part of the electoral campaign of Donald Trump. And nobody knows what they are going to give us so that the president can give it, win his election. But it's not the vaccine, the solution. The solution is really systemic uh, change that begins to value human life. That to bring, to begins to break down the isolation in which the system structurally places our lives and which has been intensified, you know, by the fear of death, the fear of a plague. And uh, we see signs of it in the big demonstration that have taken place in the United States, you know, after the death of Floyd, of George Floyd, and after the death of Breonna Taylor, and of many other, you know, black youth who has been killed during the last few months. And those demonstrations have been something more in a way that even a protest against racism, even a protest against the century of enslavement of black people, because slavery has not ended, has only taken new forms but has been also an affirmation of life, an affirmation of solidarity. People have said, no, they have gone to the street. They have gone to the street close to each other, not, not held back by the fear because COVID is not the only source of death. COVID is not the only source of death. And, uh, you know, people realize that one of the pre-existing conditions that makes us more vulnerable to dying and to disease is the existence of racism, the existence of social injustice, the existence of, so of a capitalist system that constantly, in so many ways, denies the value of our lives. And I will close here. Oh. I think it couldn't be a stronger way to close, Sylvia. Um, just to respond, I mean, there are so many different wonderful things, but to start from the end, 
Um, I mean, you spoke in the beginning of your talk uh, about this, uh, the need for this effective, uh, effective social transformation with broad coalitions and discussing, of course, now in the end, all these effects of, of racism that are extremely close, uh, connected, of course, with the history of capitalism and neoliberalism uh, and colonialism and all its uh, manifests. I mean, the first you know, obvious question here to ask is how do we tackle the fact that we have conservative neoliberal policies at the moment and an extreme rise of the alt-right and white supremacy yeah. um, uh, all around the world um, that are using also identity politics to literally fragment, let's say, uh, the working classes of all colors in that sense, because we have seen uh, specifically in the United States a very large part, it, but, but not only, and we shouldn't be tricked by that, of the electorate that is a vote, uh, that is a Trump voter belonging to the white uh, working class. So for me, this enactment, if you will, this feudal mentality of divide and conquer is very, very strong. So how would we be able to actually tackle that with goals of broader coalitions, which I completely agree with you, are essential for our survival in the next decades? Yeah, I, I would say two things that obviously, and I, again, I, I look at the United States, but I also look at Europe because Europe is not far away <laughs> from that point of view. It's identical. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, but in the United States, I'll say that there is a certain part of the population and it's not by any means the majority and, uh, but who in a way and has benefited so much from the history of slavery, from the history of the displacement of, and, and genocide of the indigenous people who are irreducible irreducible. If they could, they would have slavery today. They would have slavery. The only, the only regret is that there is no more slavery. So we have to take into account that there is a certain part of the population that there's nothing you can do because for them, holding on to, in a sense, ill-gotten wealth is fundamental. But I think it's what, what should we all worry us is the other broader sector of the population, mm -hmm. right? Who actually does not have an objective interest mm -hmm. in the maintenance of racism. Does not have an objective interest because actually the maintenance of racism is the maintenance of a system of inequalities and this investment into social reproduction that affects them as well. And, and I think that here we have to do much more to turn the table on the, on the you know, dominant propaganda. I mean, who are the, who are the immigrants, you know, for instance, who are, who are coming on those boats with nothing on their back, risking everything, risking everything in their life any day? What is that they are fleeing? They are fleeing war zones. They are fleeing places that are being destroyed with the money of the EU, and with the money, with the money that the EU is not spending in healthcare, is not spending in social services, with the money of the United States, is taken away from people's paychecks. I think we have to say that. We have to say. You want, if you want to stop immigration, then stop the warfare. If you want to stop that kind of immigration, you have to stop the warfare. Go to the EU and dismantle the armies of the different countries or the United States, who now has 800 bases, military bases across the world. 800 million, they have encircled, is a girdle, uh, encircled a crown, a deadly crown encircling the world so that no matter what, every place they can attack. Imagine. And who's paying for that? Is our children, is our daycare, 
you know, it's our dental plants that now are, are being destroyed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I Ms. think we need, we need to do a much better work of really education and, uh, you know, who's the enemy? Who owes what to whom? Who owes what to whom? Yes, I, I mean, for me particularly, uh, this is very, you know, very to the point since I'm, uh, you know, in Athens at the moment, we have just made a decision to pay 20, uh, sorry, 18 billion euros to buy boats from France and other warmongering constructions, um, you know, and just for, for, for the sake of gas and oil in the Mediterranean with oh, Turkey. Yeah. And therefore, there is no money uh, for any uh, structures to reconstruct the whole thing with Moria after the fire, which is uh, an extremely worrying uh, situation. I mean, uh, you, you spoke, um, we could talk about that for, for hours and hours, and we have spoken before as well about this, this need also of the neoliberal logic to find the scapegoat and then the scapegoat yeah. changes depending on the decade and depending on the narrative. Um, and of course, the eternal scapegoat always has been the figure of the woman. Right. Uh, and I wanted to return a little bit to that and um, possibly discuss, uh, first of all, this the seminal book that you wrote, Calvin and the Witch, where you lay out, we can say, a sort of uh, the modus operandi of the patriarchal kind of capitalist system and unearth how this transition to capitalism changed the concept and the treatment of the body. And we keep returning throughout the whole conversation that we had, not only because of COVID, to the body. And yes. of course, looking specifically at the female body as a machine that produces and is exploited and reproduces as well, of course, free labor force with you know, reproductive labor of, of given birth. Um, you really nailed of how to trace, for me, a proto-capitalist system of exploitation, highlighting uh, how surplus value really is performed on and through the female body. Absolutely. And I really, really was thinking of that because in, in your, one of your recent books, you've published uh, two or three books this last year, if I'm not mistaken. Was it three? I think it was three. Yeah. Yeah, uh, on, yeah. on periphery of the skin, you, you have a beautiful phrase, and I'm going to, to read it. You say, the history of the body must be told by weaving together the histories of those who were enslaved, colonized, or turned into waged workers or unpaid housewives, and the histories of children. Yes. And, I mean, there the structures and the exhibition that we are have here with Capuani is looking into the structures of the plantation. So I'm, I'm using a little bit this weaving that you're talking about, the weaving of all these different histories. Yes. Uh, and the fact that from my research, I, I discovered that in the plantation already before the industrial revolution, we had a proto-capitalist machine of forced labor. Women were forced to actually learn how yes. to dye, weave, and create all that was used from clothes to everything. And I was thinking that at this moment when you were discussing before uh, all these women that are running from work to the children, uh, to the Zoom, to uh, provide to, for the family, that is this um, almost 24 hour uh, yes. labor that never ends. Never uh, ends, yeah. And, and I wanted you to, a little bit discuss how do you see that from the 70s again there there have been um, you know uh, very important uh, periods of your work where you discussed uh, housework uh, and uh, yeah. as, as, as wage labor and how how do you see this transition from 78 until now where it seems that we have come because of COVID but because of many other things like uh, like all these like turbo capitalists like Naomi Klein calls it situation that we're in how do you see it that it seems that we are getting into a worse situation as women in relationship to our labor? Yeah, there's been many solutions and changes, solution in quotes, but each of them really opening a new crisis. You know, one classical uh, effect of women, but a large number of women taking wage jobs has been the reduction of reproductive work. You know, I mentioned before that, and this is very, very interesting, 
I mean, I don't think it is enough focused upon. The moment masses of women are now after fighting and so on enter the wage workforce is the moment when across the world, the state defunds reproduction. <laughs> yeah, you have the exception of a neoliberal state that begins to cut investment in childcare, in elder care, care to the chronically ill, et cetera, et cetera. So women go out of the home, right? And nothing replaces it. Nothing replaces the vacuum. So something, yes, for women who have a higher income. Yeah, I was going to say again, it's, it's a class exactly question. Is the immigration, right? The solution becomes Im immigrant women who come from societies, from countries that have been drastically impoverished through the austerity program, structural adjustment, through really a recolonization process. Structural adjustment has been a total recolonization process. And so they come and, but that's not of course a solution. That's been a new crisis. Otherwise you have massive reduction of housework, meaning fast food, meaning obesity, meaning the children coming home from school alone an exponential increase in the number of children now diagnosed with mental illnesses. In the United States, more than 8 million children are now clinically diagnosed, and we are told the number is much, much higher, right? And they are given three or four pills a day, Ritalin, antidepressant, et cetera, et cetera. Clearly, it's a product of the crisis in the family, the tension, the fact there is no time for them, the fact that also the school programs have been completely devalued. The, all the best programs have been taken away and education is like a big testing process. So, uh, and otherwise it's a double job. And uh, doing the, the housework at 11 o'clock at night is the 24 hours work day. No, no time for recuperation, you know, no time for, and, and with all of that, with all of that, we find that the majority of women in the United States who are working for the wage are falling every day more into debt. In other words, the wage is never enough no. yeah. for the majority, only as man, a minority has acquired some autonomy. The majority can only work to be entitled to borrow money from a bank. The wage is the collateral to obtain a debt from a bank. And of course they fall more and more. So it's a very, even, even without COVID. No, no, exactly. It, I mean, COVID is just an amplification. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I also wanted to discuss something that um, uh, really I was thinking since our latest conversations, and you mentioned it quite a lot today, um, all this need for collectivization and bringing together and yeah. um, connecting yeah. the struggles and looking at it through the feminist perspective. And of course, let's say um, the female in, in, in general, whatever that means. Um, I wanted to, to ask is possible that we can consider collective labor and I want to link it a little bit also with the book which is uh, witch hunting uh, and women mm -hmm. and which for me was extremely inspiring particularly your fifth chapter and I started gossips as a as a proposition to reclaim the word uh, outside of the patriarchal context so of course collective female labor is a two-sided coin in the sense that back then uh, that was also a, let's say a locus for exploitation and has been consistently ever since but then we can consider it as also a locus for I, I dare say revolution in the sense of having uh, the possibility to politicizing yourself yes uh, right. by exchanging knowledges right so, uh, I, wanted I wanted you to, to discuss, discuss a little bit um, all the experiences that you have had in South America, because you have been visiting a lot uh, yes. women collectives throughout, not only in Mexico, also in Ecuador, Amazonia. Uh, and 
wanted to also discuss this in relationship to what you were talking before, because it seems that the, the, the majority of, of these powerful coalitions arrives from uh, women that belong to working classes and impoverished populations in the so-called underdeveloped world or third world or wh whatever in quotation marks we want to call it. Um, so I wanted a little bit your thoughts on that. Yeah, the, very important because there is a way in which uh, you know you can become simply a substitute for what the, the state does not provide and so you only reproduce the poverty. And this is not what I'm proposing and this is not what I've seen. I think the situation in Latin America you know, that you find, for example, in the periphery of many urban cities, in the so-called favelas, which are always presented as, you know, in purely negative terms. Exactly. Actually, there have been places of great women's organizing. And if people have not died, you know, in those areas where practically the state provides no services, only a military presence, is because women have organized. I think two things have, have made those experiences in a way you know, particularly important. On one side, many of the women and the people who live in those favelas, in those Vija Miseria in Argentina, big encampments created through collective labor, mostly women's labor, but not only women's labor. Uh, those, those people come from communities, indigenous community, who had a tradition of collective work, right? Here, collective work, the cooperation, the tradition of cooperation has been destroyed over the centuries. Uh, in many parts of the world, it's still there. You know, people still have had communal ownership of land, communal control of land. And that has created a culture where you tend to see solution, not in individual terms. One of the obstacles we have is this profound interiorization of individualism. And there's a profound, more than we are aware of, right? I think because, it's like the definition of neoliberal subjectivity is this, this exactly. detachment. It's what Lynn Layton talks about, especially in relationship to psychoanalysis, how we are totally detached from anything that doesn't belong to our very close, let's say, class of family and friends to, to those that are familiar Absolutely. to us. And, and also, uh, one, one thing, and also that in many cases, you know, those, uh, those urban forms of organization have come into existence in response to very clear political crisis. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, the, the cold golpe of, uh, in Chile, Pinochet, uh, the, the big, you know, destruction of the economy in 2000 in Argentina when all the banks closed. So that in a way, the moment, the political moment has never been separated as it shouldn't be, as it shouldn't, because it's not in reality, you know, from the moment of reproduction. So the, so the women who come together, I don't know, to, to organize a, a, a crash, to organize daycare, but then, would have next a, a meeting of political formation, a meeting of political discussion as to what all this means. And so I we can say that maybe starting small might be much more interested in order to kind of broaden these, uh, mm -hmm. these coalitions. Just one last note, and then I will go to uh, some very interesting questions that we have uh, from, from the audience. Um, I mean, I'm thinking that, of course, the fact that we have this detachment uh, has to do with commodification and this mania that you know that we have become such capitalist subjects ourselves. But wouldn't you also pinpoint somehow in the 70s, you know, with Thatcherism and Reagan in the States, the collapse of the union? Because that, in relationship to labor, I think somehow uh, created a different mentality for what we could call the West widely in relationship to. Uh, collectively yeah. claiming our rights. You see, I think it's even much broader than that. Because when I think I lived through that period, and I remember it felt, you know, for the people who lived in those areas, it felt like COVID. Uh, this is the period in which a whole huge area 
of the United States. The industrial northeast, right? As I said, Flint, Michigan, Detroit, Ohio, was basically in the space of uh, a few years dismantled. Uh, you should go if you went if you go to Detroit. Detroit is a very I've been to Detroit. I mean, the oh complete my God. collapse of yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you you had you had building where there were thousands and thousands of people, and now they're empty. They're oh, full. Okay. So that destroy not only the union, that destroy a whole system of life that over the generation had created a powerful means of resistance it created a popular working class counterpower. In other words, when they move, when the industrial East moved, you know, in a strike or uh, the, the, the state had to pay attention, you know, the bosses had to pay attention, pay attention. because this was made of solidarities built not only in the factories themselves, but the wives knew each other, the children knew each other. They danced, they went to the music hall, to the dancing together. The people, there was a whole system during the strike of helping each other, mutual aid. You know, all of that was built over a generation and then it was dismantled. This is one of the crises that in the United States we have suffered. And I know the very similar processes have also taken place in Europe. I know that in Italy, for example, the big fear, you know, they, they dismantled fear and they brought it, you know, in different parts of the world. But uh, you know, those, those uh, communities were very strong, you know, the ties are built uh, over generation. And I think this is one of the crises. That's why, they could also uh, implement, you know, such drastic reduction, you know, of investment in reproduction. Um, just to to link this also, um, because you also, uh, I kept this phrase. I loved it. Reappropriation of our decision of power, because we've talked about that before as well. This relationship of a child mother or child father that we have with the states which yes. because of the loss of this collective ability to uh, inform one another exchange knowledges yes. and be more critical we, we seem to be more dependent to the state and now we are in a situation of course uh, of in many countries not all of them with imposed lockdowns and your proposition as well as maria galindo uh, when you gave this beautiful speech in in athens uh, at the feminist collective you also mentioned maria this proposition of uh, let's say defiance uh, against the state i think the word abandonment was used but not literal so uh, also uh, liza and leila are asking the same thing that uh, i think i've asked you in the past like how can we organize collectively and how we can augment, let's say our group power and create further coalitions when in many cases we are uh, enforced uh, by this state of exception that is being used for the pandemic as well. Not that it's not necessary, of course, for, for, for some uh, reasons, but we have seen absurd ways of the state imposing this power. So how can we, in, in this state of exception of a, of a global pandemic, uh, try to enact this collectivity? I, I, think, I think we can. I mean, the same way, for example, as people have come together to organize, you know, imagine in Portland, Oregon, in Portland, Oregon, for a hundred days, people were now demonstrating. In New York, for two months after the killing of George Floyd and Brianna Taylor, almost every day, Afternoon and evening, there was demonstration. People came together, not irresponsibly. There was always an attempt to keep distances in the demonstration, wearing the mask, etc. It's never absolute, of course, but responsibly. But people can come together, and uh, I think that this is extremely important because, for example, to me. 
it has to do with the reproduction, whether it is food and so on, but it has to do also with the relationship to the state. I think we have to move away from the idea that the struggle is to force the state to give us only certain services which we do not yeah. control, which we do not control. We have to be able to have mechanism of control on what is happening. I want to tell you something. I don't know if there's time. You know, yeah, there is I, time. Absolutely, there is time. For there you, there's is always time. But uh, I, I've had breast cancer. And, uh, you know, and for a year, I've been in and out of hospital and, and uh, you know, the, and, and I cannot tell you. First of all, I always fear more the doctors than my body. Yeah. I was always afraid of them the more than my body. And then the experience of being in a large room with 30 women, all separate in our fear, with this little robe, waiting for the mammogram, waiting for the death sentence or the life sentence. And I, I remember one day, you know, I had one of those epiphany and I felt, what have they done to us? I had the images of these beautiful, powerful women in the women's movement, of these beautiful women, strong, all of a sudden we saw each other as so beautiful, as so powerful, strong, and what have they done to us? And why we are there waiting for them to say, you live or you die. And we don't, we are not there together talking to each other, having something to say, sharing what our experience was. Why could we not have met in the street, in our community and talk and organize and present demands? Because when we go and we face, I mean, the way they have their conception of what they will do to you. And I've learned you have to fight it often because that conception is not always good for you. And I won't go into that now, but these are the kind of experiences. No, we have something to say. We cannot go in, uh, in many black communities, you know, women now, I know in New York, black women are scared of going to give birth alone. We're and they to ask now, about that. If you want to talk a little bit about that and that, that you're one, involved one minute, They now go with the doula. The doula is an advocate who is in charge of making sure that as you are concentrating on your body and you're concentrating on giving birth, they are not going to do anything to you that is not appropriate. And that you're treated with respect. You're treated with respect. So I think this idea of not confronting the institution alone can be concretely translated in many different ways. But it implies in all cases, in a coming together, in the decision to break the isolation, in the decision that the other woman there has something to say that you can trust her and that together we can actually think, you know, expand our consciousness and uh, gain more strength with regard to the institutions. Uh, I mean, we've, we've talked about this particular <coughs> thing in relationship to the institution of uh, you know, of medicine, which is the hospital and the whole big pharma and the implications yeah. that this has had uh, to, uh, you know, an array of different types of women throughout the world. Um, and I think this is, um, yeah, this is something that I will keep kind of pestering you in the future because exactly, I don't think we have been talking about that. I mean, I remember last time we were talking, I had a similar experience as well in hospital and I was thinking it is as if we are cows um, yes. You know, it, it was very much in the sense of, you know, these big meat industries where yeah. uh, cattle is kind of pushed yeah. through through one direction. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I want to first uh, respond to another question um, from Danica. And she's she's asking uh, that the pandemic, of course, has brought a rapid influx of, of remote labor and working from home. And she wanted you, if, if you can, to... Um, to, to talk about a little bit, reflect a bit further on this development uh, uh, that, that we see of this kind of I isolating work. And of course, 
you, you addressed a lot how that affects uh, women that also have to take care of their family. But um, I think one other thing uh, that we haven't talked about is mental health and how that affects, how isolation has affected immensely uh, uh, women and men, of course, everyone uh, that has been forced to work yeah. alone and be excluded from the collectivity of an open space and office right. uh, exchange. Absolutely. And, you know, have to put this also in a context because you have the isolation, but many often you have also the anxiety about the economic anxiety. Yeah, exactly. Both partners or one of the partners has lost the job. You don't have the money and you're risking eviction, right? And uh, I mean, there is so, and, and you are, you are uh, confined with a man that might be violence. The tensions are also exacerbating the potential for violence. We know, for example, that women who have high levels of debt are far more exposed to violence, to male violence in the home than those who have no debts, because it creates a tension. And of course, this is not, it's not the tension. Obviously, there's a patriarchal structure. Right? But I think it's also the dependency so, of, yeah. the, you know, being yeah. financially dependent possibly makes you. Absolutely. The anxiety about the future escalates all the crises in the family. And then we have to think of family who don't have, uh, you know, many amount of rooms. We're in the same room. I know, for example, friends who are now restructuring their houses. The little space they have, they have to restructure because it's inconceivable that in the same room you have a woman at the table working on a job and then you have a child trying to keep up with the lessons with the school and uh, and maybe a, the man as well it, you know so it, it's it's madness in many places take new york where rents are extremely high and the space in which people it's are tiny. is constantly reducing to have a family all together working at home it's really a level of crisis that that is a little hell and um, we hear continuously of the implication for mental health you know children are really losing a lot of time in terms of learning they are very anxious and uh, those in particular who have special problems and uh, but the whole family the anxiety is extremely extremely high I wanted to also follow up on that. And depression. And dep yeah, exactly. Especially the, and the link of that with, uh, again, I'm going to go to Big Pharma and how there is uh, this uh, al almost uh, regimented way of control through uh, uh, opioids, which is one of the hugest uh, crises yes. uh, in the US. Uh, but um, I want to link it with a question that uh, Zuni uh, Denk is, is, is asking. Uh, of course, when we have this type of uncertainty that goes along with uh, an anxiety and a trauma that uh, I've read a lot of research lately that is discussing it as PTSD trauma of yeah. this, this extreme condition, how can we organize and how can we, when we have this type of uncertainty in terms of, uh, you know, being in such a precarious condition of a labor, and then I want to ask you something else about labor. But I, I think I think the solution is really the breaking of the isolation. Uh, one of the things, I mean, uh, you know, just judging from my own life, uh, you know, I, I'm very lucky. I live close to a park and I can go take a walk. But the other thing also, I have a women's group and some of the women in my group, and we never stop seeing each other. We decided that we have to be responsible to each other. We have to trust each other, which means we take all the precautions that are necessary, and but we have refused to break down our relationship. And, uh, and I must say, after so many months, it's been a lifeline to be able to actually see my friend, but the women I work with, and uh, it's been a lifeline. You know? And I, I would say the issues of trust, the issues of care and solidarity are especially important now. You know, the question of taking responsibility for our life and the life of the people that we are with. 
you know? So I think it's possible. I think we have to get away from this mentality. You breathe the air and you're going to die. You know, there's something that we can be done. You know, there, there are, life may be more laborious, but there are things that we can do so that we can actually get together. And worse in a park, if you cannot do it in a home. Right now, I live in Brooklyn, close to Prospect Park. And uh, the park is now full. It's an actually quite amazing to see of children, you know, dozens and dozens of little classrooms, age two to seven, are now meeting in the, in the park. And it's beautiful to see all these children now. But people can still come together. Okay, I think that's answered very well. And then I, 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 you also spoke about instituting processes of uh, reappropriation of wealth. And of course, yeah. coming from uh, a Marxist tradition, uh, all these years you have really been pushing for this. Yeah. But again, I'm going to play the devil's advocate here uh, in a condition at this very moment where we have an extreme division in terms of class structures. Uh, even more uh, differences between classes uh, and, I mean, impoverization of a lot of people from the working class that are going even below. Zero flex, flex workers, zero contract workers, uh, workers that during the pandemic did not have the ability to stop because if they would stop, they would not be able to pay the rent. And this new class that we, we see, not only in the States, but I would say also in Europe, of month to month being able to survive. Therefore, you're not exactly poor, you're not exactly uh, disenfranchised and impoverished, but if anything goes wrong, uh, then you're completely ruined. How can we work through that? Because it's- yeah, seems yeah, Look, the situation is already, it's not even razor edge. It's not this or that, it's already disaster, <laughs> you know? And uh, one of the things I didn't mention when I spoke of how the likely restructuring from a capitalist viewpoint is that in fact, mm, the greatest fear is that uh, they will use, you know, the, the argument, you know, about the subsidies that they have been forced to give most of them in the US have gone to the big companies, the airlines and so on. Some of the companies have returned the money even, but huge transfer of money, even more than in 2008. No, this is the second time money is transferred by- Banks, banks airlines, etc. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I think that the fear is that now all this trillion, we will have to pay for them and that there will be further cuts and perhaps the dismantling of what is being left of the New Deal, the dismantling of social security. I mean, there's been a great eagerness on the side of all politicians to dismantle social security in the US. And you probably have similar program in Europe. And that is, so my fear is, they are going to use these huge trillions of money and uh, with the shock effect say, well, we have no choice, right? So conclusion, unless people organize and really overcome, overcome this inertia and division, we are going to have a situation that is going to be very dramatic. Um, we are told that within the next two, three months, 40 million people in the United States are likely to be evicted, 40 million people. Already now, we are talking about thousands and thousands who are going to bed hungry. The figure before COVID was 50 million people in the United States are at the poverty or yeah. below the poverty level, right? So unless something, you know, this is, this of course is a, it's an open question. Are people going to accept this drastic popularization of their life, which is going to be very, very broad, not only in terms of the black population who has been there all along, 
no? But certainly a lot of also poor white working class people who now are losing their job by the thousands. Unemployment keeps going up every month. You know, more people are applying for unemployment benefit. I mean, the, so the predictions for Europe now are about... Yeah, I guess this is the fundamental question. You know, I think this is the fundamental question. The money is obviously there. You no know, trillion have been the, the, the number of trillions that have been spent to finance the wars, these 800 military bases across the world, to finance the army, the police. The New York police is the seventh largest army in the world. They have a budget of billions. So these are the choices. It's really life and death in many ways. And in different, to different degrees, these choices are not only about the US. I think in Europe, we have the same situation. I know in, the Italian economy has been devastated. No, it's the same for Greece. A society, a society that's been built on tourism, where every, every yes, four- Yes, and now you had zero. <laughs> Yeah, so rebuilding the lo locality, rebuilding the local economies, relocalizing the economy. I think that's a very important element. Relocalizing also means people have control on what is being produced. People can have decision making on what is being produced, how it is being produced, in what working condition, right? And not. You know, they, they, you now have countries like Italy have been turned into museums. Imagine a town like Venice, where every summer you have uh, millions of people and only 50,000 inhabitants. It has become so unlivable that everybody is fleeing the city. 50,000 people live in the city, but every year you have millions are coming and land. And now this is exploding. The tourists are not there and there's no revenue. Everything is sinking. <laughs> it, talking about tourism also, and of course this tourism of uh, you know, moving from one place to the next, there is a question that I, I forgot to see with, from my friend uh, Jacques Serbars. Most of it we have answered, but he's, he's asking, do we need to reinstate the notion of class in this sense? Like how can we define class, of course, when we, uh, the attack occurs from all sides uh, and all forms of capitalism. Do we need to address class at this very moment? Of, of also the state class of class is fundamental, you know. Unfortunately, the concept of class, you know, has been defined in such a narrow term by the Marxist unionist tradition, has been defined such a that it's become totally discredited. You know, so many people have been left out of the class that and so many issues. So for instance, to me, when a woman decides to that she does not want to, you know, carry the burden of five children, she wants to decide what children she will have. That's a class issue, you know, in a society where the state, by penalizing abortion, for instance, at least for white women, uh, by penalizing abortion, controls our body our reproductive capacity. So this is a class issue. It's saying, no, I'm not producing children for the state. I'm not producing children for your factories, your armies, right? And uh, so it seems to me the class relates to the exploitation of work. It relates to the fact that you have the majority of people have been deprived, stripped of the means to support themselves. And uh, we don't have, and this is where the concept of reappropriation comes in. I don't like to speak of a redistribution of wealth. I don't no. like redistribution. It still has this managerial and this idea that is a charity from above. No, it's reappropriation because this is wealth that people have produced. Our own ancestors have produced. Taking and back the means of production, basically. Taking man the means of classical and, motto. And reproduction, and reproduction. And reproduction. And I, I, I have to also another question that comes from Italy. 
Uh-huh. And I would say uh, is an interesting question. It's it's kind of deviating a little bit from the subject, but it's a very, very interesting question. Also, me being Greek, I kind of relate to it. It says that she, she's been reading your work and uh, what kind of advice would you give to young adult women, specifically those that live in more conservative societies and those that want to or have to get in a line of work that is traditionally female, such as care work, teachers, nurses, cleaners, etc. I think it's a very, yeah. very good question. Yeah, it's a very good question because I think, you see, we have internalized, all of us, we have internalized also the devaluation that capitalism has placed on reproductive work, right? And so many times when women say, oh, let's leave the home, let's leave, etc." cetera. Uh, many times it appears that only certain kind of work carry a certain prestige. And I would say, you know, we have to be very careful because care work, for instance, the raising of children and many forms of housework can be extremely creative activities. The fact that they're not creative activities and they're very oppressive is because of the way in which we have been forced to live them and to organize. I mean, the example of, for me, cooking, for instance, that's a very powerful activity. It involves culture. It involves aesthetics. It involves nutritional knowledge, science, to know, for example, what is good, what is not good for our bodies, right? And if we do it together with other people, it's a moment of sociality. It's a moment of exchanging you know, cultural knowledge, right? But when you have to cook every day in the miserable condition (laughs) of most people's household, it's terrible. Same thing with care work. So we need to make a struggle to revalue these activities, both economically and also culturally, materially, in terms of social recognition and recognition by ourselves. You know, frankly, I used to be a little annoyed when, you know, every night in New York at seven o'clock, you know, everybody opened their windows and they clapped for the essential workers. I don't know if it happened in Europe. And eh? at seven o'clock. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, th- I think it started from Italy, actually. Right. But, you know, and, and I think many of the women were also annoyed. The care workers would say, no, don't clap but fight so that we can have a better position. You know, actually go out and fight so that the work that we do does not have to be a work that makes us risk our lives or that is so undervalued, underpaid, underrecognized. I mean, what is happening in the hospital is a scandal. It's really a scandal. There's nothing that has to do with the disease has to do with the choices that, in New York, imagine, from the early 80s to present, 19 hospitals that served people with low income have been shut down, right? And uh, so the fact that there were no beds, the fact there were no TTP, the fact that there were no provisions was not accidental, was the result of calculation. That's the struggle. Yeah, so it's is... not that care work is, is not the problem. Men should want to do care work. Men should want to do care work as well. I mean, obviously there is a, there is a it, it tends to be somehow a minority, but there is a lot of care work specifically yeah. nursing that, that men have been doing the last decades. But for me, this, this um, point that you bring, and I think this is maybe a nice way to also culminate the conversation is the concept of healthcare because looking into, um, I mean, the state, I think the states is a a specific uh, example that, uh, you know, has no comparison, but also looking at the policies in the European Union that have changed so much the last 30 years, 40 years uh, of having a social uh, welfare, having a state that provides free healthcare And now we have come to a point where this is diminishing, 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 diminishing. Um, And some basic things uh, um, 
are not provided for free anymore. And then again, of course, comes uh, yes. the question of means. Um, what is very um, uh, disturbing, for a lack of a better word, and always flabbergasting me is why do people not react to the fact, and you also, you proposed uh, before um, uh, a, a way of recuperation, not recuperation, sorry, you said, you, you discussed about um, uh, wanting to prevent rather than cure of yes. this politics of prevention. And I wanted to, to link this with healthcare because I think it's a big question of the moment, especially in relation yeah. to COVID, that the policies of the last 40 years in terms of healthcare have completely abandoned the concept of prevention and are only interested in the concept of cure or uh, let's say medicine to provide the medicine. Uh, not always, of course, because if you're a lost case, you know, in examples of, of, of cancer in many European countries, we see that if someone is uh, of an age above, um, they won't, they just won't try. They will say you can go home and, you know, die, die in peace. So for me, healthcare is an extremely important part of the relationship of the citizen with the state. And I'll get yeah. a, a citizen that is paying taxes, you know, right. every month to, to have something delivered, which is never delivered. How do you feel, well, how do you see that it is that there is no reaction to this lack of services? And I mean, of course, there's a lot of discussion now in the States in terms of, uh, you know, uh, some basic universal healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. But this is not strong enough yet. Uh, and in Europe, it's not strong enough at all. It's people, uh, we are here in the Netherlands, where healthcare is completely private. And the, 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 my experience has been, oh, there's nothing wrong with you. You just take a Panadol and go home. So uh, there, is, there is not a desire to actually uh, look into what might be wrong. So for me, the question is, how, what do you think has happened the last 20 to 30 years that has made no, us not go yeah, out in the streets? We have been... We have been uh... Yeah, there's been a, a, a process, you know, I think partially has been has due to the fact that um, the situation I was describing before, even before the COVID, like women so consumed by working outside the home, taking care of, of children and whatever, or sometimes trying to go to school, trying to, you know, change their life and that it's been very difficult more and more to engage in the kind of processes that uh, would address the question. I hope that now the experience of the COVID and the fact that thousands and thousands of women, particularly as nurses, the famous essential workers, have had an unforgettable experience. Many, many of them you know, at the end of the day, crying, said that they will never, this has changed their life. They will never be able to go back to, in whatever condition, to their previous life. Because what they have seen has impacted their subjectivity so much. So I think something has happened. Something has happened and now may change that trend. And I would say that what needs to happen is precisely that collective coming together to do the work of prevention. I mean, you know, I spoke of the 19th century, the People's Health Movement in the United States. There were women's club all over the countries. They were actually learning. They were actually learning about the body, about procreation, about herbs. There's a whole tradition of women curanderas, healers yes. in Latin America, et cetera, right? So to reappropriate that and the work of prevention, understanding what is that is making us sick. But the other side, which I think is very, 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 very important is that on the basis of their work also to connect those of us who are in the community with those who are in the institution with the nurses, because the women are working in institutions, they too are very unhappy. They too are confronting an institution very often who, who devalues them, 
who doesn't list, doesn't give them what they need, you know, doesn't listen to what they have to offer in terms of their knowledge, is extremely bureaucratic. It's organized for profit. Tremendous amount. I mean, uh, really, profit is the big uh, category that shapes the medical care, at least in the United States. So we need that input. We need that connection, the constant connection of the women in the community also to decide what is it, this care that they gave us. I, for instance, I had to say, ignorant as I am, but I had many times to challenge what they were proposing to do to me because I knew it was not good. I knew it, but they had a protocol. And once they have a protocol, they will apply no matter what. And, and, uh, and I've read now a number of books of women who have gone through the experience of cancer and some are terrifying. And I've noticed this constant, constant fear of, uh, you know, of, of the therapies that often are quite terrifying. And uh, not necessarily, many women often have said that some of the therapy, if they had, they would have preferred to die rather than to do them. So I think we need, we need to have this collaboration, not only among in the communities, but also with the women in the institution to have the constant exchange. They need our support and we need their knowledge. They understand what is happening you know, in a way that we need in order to know how to move, to proceed. And just to close, because I had this question for, for uh, after reading Periphery, um, I mean, you're, you're discussing literally now the, the fear that exists because of this institution, which is the hospital and what it represents. And of course, immediately one goes to, uh, to Foucault and uh, his, his discussion on, on biopower, but, um, but I would also say, in a way, also the necropolitics of Membe, but let's not go there. Uh, for me, you mentioned in the book that you want to somehow uh, consciously separate your approach uh, from this description of power as a meta, just to talk generally about, about power and to close about power, because the whole discussion is about power in the end. Um, you re refuse somehow to, to um, adopt, let's say, uh, this uh, idea of Foucault, of, of this me metaphysicality and this yes. intangibility of, of, of power. Um, yes. uh, and you, you discuss how capitalism basically renders it impossible to discuss it universal. And I think this is an, a, a really, really super interesting claim. And I wanted you a little bit to talk about that. And I think it's, uh, we, we can close with that. Yeah, because, you know, uh, biopower, it's a, it's a very metaphysical concept in the same way as Foucault is very metaphysical when he speaks of power. And it seems to me that if we look at the changes that have taken place, you know, in the medical institution, in the state with relation to health, for instance, you know, in the 18th or 19th century, and particularly the 19th century, what we see, we see a response that... Uh, you know, it's very much shaped by a new strategy, a new capitalist strategy that has been forced by struggles and has been forced also by the fear that, uh, you know, was very prominent in uh, the mid 19th century, that the working class was not able to reproduce itself. And, and I explain, you know, um, at the peak of the Industrial Revolution in the 1850s, you had workers who were dying when they were 40, 40 years old. And this is happening at the time when capitalism is trying to shift, you know, in industry from light industry to, to heavy. heavy industry. You know, the big change, you know, the transition to coal, the railroad, steel, which demanded a very different organization of work and mm -hmm. a much stronger worker, much stronger worker. So you have a shift. Yeah? Instead of constantly reducing you know, wages and making people live in abject poverty, dying very young, you know, there is a change that also is uh, forced by the struggles. 
And uh, the change is, okay, now we invest in the working class, sending the women have home, life expectancy creating, housework, creating the nuclear family, the working class, nuclear family, the child, the, the, the children go to school, the, the women go back to the community and engage into housework. You know, for example, in, in the United States, in many factories, they will put a woman that would check the, the houses of the workers to see whether the wives who were mostly immigrants were actually able to cook, et cetera. So there's a whole investment. And they do it because they assume that if they invest in the working class, workers will be more productive. And they will also be more you know, pacified. They will not cease, they will cease to struggle. No. The horrifying uh, policies of assimilation as well yeah, right. of all the migrant communities. You don't find this in Foucault. There is this metaphysical shift, biopower. Now capital, in, no, the power investing in people's life. That to me makes no sense. I need to see what is the actual historical and social uh, factors that motivated that change. Well, thank you so very much, Sylvia. Uh, you are, as always, you are like an avalanche. Mm -hmm. uh, no, thank you. It's because I'm an older woman. No. <laughs> <laughs> when, you're, when you're home, you have more time to, to accumulate stories. Accumulate stories, yes. Or the opposite, you know, I think it, it's not only related to age, I think it's also related to your fierceness. So thank you very much for that. And I'm going to you and to you all. Eh? If Big hug to you. Big all. hug, big hug. And the best to all those who are listening to us. Okay, so we're rounding up this keynote now. Uh, so, indeed, thank you very much, Sylvia. And thank also, you, thank you, Iliana. Uh, also, Vivian thank and you, Jeroen, Vivian. who is uh, for the technical thank help. You all. Uh, thank you all uh, for listening and for tuning in. Um, for everyone who is interested, uh, we have our next keynote online as well on the 16th of October by Trevor Baiklin. So keep an eye on that website as well. Uh, thank you all for listening, for joining, for asking the questions also. And um, yeah, have a very good evening. You too. You thank too. you. Bye. Bye, Sylvia. Talk soon. Bye. Bye, Joe. Bye, Vivian. Bye, Liana. <laughs>